we interrupt your regularly scheduled programming to bring you a special presentation of Two Nerds, the podcast. Your home for everything movies, movie, music, video games, and everything in between. With your host, Bunny the Bruiser. How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Two Nerds, a podcast. I am your host, Buddy the Bruiser. At this exact moment in time, it is almost 9 p.m. here in Ohio, and it is almost 10 a.m. in Japan, which is where Dynamite Jared is is right now. He just got back from New Japan Pro Wrestling, Uh, so I'm excited to hear about that when he gets back next week. So, he is obviously not here this week, and back by popular demand. I got my boy here, and who is it? Uh, It's Alex Del Pryor. What's going on, guys? Al Del Pryor, my illustrious guest from the Top 10 Modern Classics video. Highly critically acclaimed episode of the show. The fans were demanding that Al comes back to the show. Yeah, I can't even count the number of tweets I got just begging me to come (laughs) back, and I kept telling everybody, you know, my schedule's real busy, but I'll... I'll see if I can do it, and I I thankfully got this opportunity to come back. Very cool. So before we jump right into it here, um, I noticed over there you have a board game, Horrified. Yes, we do. With the Universal Monsters. Have you played it? Yeah, we've played it two or three times. Because I I own the game, but I have never played it. So so tell me a little bit about this game. Oh, it's an absolute blast. So depending on how many people you play and what difficulty you kind of play on, you, uh, choose either two three up to four i think monsters and they're kind of just going around killing villagers attacking you your your mission is basically to to kill them there's like you said there's the the typical universal monsters so dracula uh, swamp monster just the mummy there's a lot of generic ones but it's a blast it's a very good time uh it's one of the board games i had a roommate not too long ago who lived with us and he brought that game and then he ended up moving out, and we actually rebought it because I enjoyed it so much. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I've had it. I think it that came out in like June ish, mm-hmm. and it was one of those where like I'm a big like Universal guy, so like as soon as I saw that that thing existed, I had to get it. But I have not played it yet. Yeah, so I'd I was just kind of kind of curious about it there. Um, so yeah, as we mentioned, you were in our top 10 modern classics video. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to be talking about what may be another modern classic, but just was not out at the time that we had recorded. Um, and I mean, you saw the thumbnail, you've read the title of the video. We're talking about The Lighthouse, the newest film by Robert Eggers, it is Robert, right? It's not Roger. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely an R. Right. Yeah, he is the director of The Witch. Um, very good movie. What did you think of The Witch? I know it was ne- on neither of our lists that we did, but I enjoyed it. I mean, yeah, I didn't, didn't think it was bad or anything. But the, the Witch is one that I need to go back and revisit. Um, I I thought it was okay. I didn't like it as much as everybody else did. I think I need to watch it again. But there's definitely some scenes stuck with me. It gets real wild at the end of that movie, yeah. and I, I thought it was. If nothing else, it was a real unique and refreshing take on the horror genre. Yeah, I mean, like, the majority of it is just, like, a period family drama. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you're stuck in, I mean, it's the Crucible, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, like, I, yeah. but then the ending, yeah, goes, like, batshit insane. But, yeah, I thought I thought it was pretty good. I was really looking forward to The Lighthouse when I saw it. As we mentioned, I'm a big fan of the Universal Monsters, and this film if you've seen the trailers or anything, is obviously done in the style of, like, a movie from the 30s or 40s or 50s. Um, as Al mentioned, it is shot in an aspect ratio yeah. that you do not see. Yeah, it's in a 3-4 aspect ratio, I believe. Yeah. Uh, which I tend to not notice. I don't know what it is, but I just seem to completely blank out when there's uh, blank parts. Don't even notice them. I mean, the screen could have been a 3-4 size for all I would have known, and... I wouldn't know the difference. My girlfriend Holly pointed out to me afterwards. She mentioned the aspect ratio was a little distracting, and I was like, "Oh wait, it was a it square." Was a, yeah, I guess it was a three-four. <laughs> yeah, because you see, that's like one of the first things that I notice. Because like whenever I watch a movie and it's in like six by nine, like your TV is like right yeah. now, like it's super distracting because I was like, "Okay, this is how they shoot TV shows." Yeah, and like I like the 
it's called like 235 to 1 where you have like the normal like letterbox on it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, that's what looks like a film. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, of course. So I know, it just bugs me when movies do not have the letterbox on them. I'm just like, why is it so wide? Yeah, it's I didn't annoying. think much of it. But I <laughs> think a lot of that comes down to I was just so distracted by the movie and everything about it. It was so captivating. And it just I, I didn't even notice. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's just dive right into it. I mean, obviously, you have just said that you really, really liked it. I liked it a lot as well. Um, yeah, I <laughs> I don't know how to start things off here. I mean, it's sort of like a, a crazy movie. We're going to go spoiler free for this beginning section here, and then we'll have to dive in a little bit uh, to the spoiler territory because you really can't talk about a lot of it without getting into the spoilers. Right, yeah. Um, but I guess first off, it's obviously it's shot in black and white. Um, it stars Willem Dafoe, who is one of the all-time greats, and this is one of his best roles, I'd say. Yeah, I will say, too, he's, admittedly, I was a little bit, I'm a little iffy on Willem Dafoe, because I watched Antichrist. I was, I was gonna mention this, and this is, yeah. a, this, this is a brief spoiler, but it doesn't really matter too much, because it doesn't give anything away about the plot or anything, uh, but how many times have you seen Willem Dafoe naked now? And Antichrist alone, <laughs> too many. Although, if you guys don't know much about Antichrist, it's a Lars von Trier piece, which should really tell you all you need to know. It's real over the top. It's real artsy. It's also the most graphic movie I've ever seen in my life. Uh, it starts out with just like a full-blown close-up sex scene of Willem Dafoe, and I forget who uh, who his opposite is, but like... Just straight, close-up, full penetration. I didn't expect to see that in a movie. I don't know. Uh, I don't know <laughs> what, why. What, what, what were you expecting? Uh, not what? that. I, didn't, I had no expectations going in. So I, if I had known what the movie was about, I probably would have sat it out. But I didn't. So it's, it's a little hard to look at Willem Dafoe. There's some <laughs> scenes that are a little more graphic than just that. And it gets a little, little rough. But uh, that being said, that was the last Willem Dafoe thing I had seen. I even skipped, uh, what was that game he was in? There was a game he was in with um, some people who made Heavy Rain. What is it, Beyond Two Souls, maybe? I'm not sure. Yeah, he was in, so he was in a game that I actually, I own. It was free one month. I, I can't bring myself to play it. <laughs> After that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, it's it's taken a little bit of getting uh, getting used to seeing him again. But <laughs> I will say he looks so vastly different in this that it was almost like it was almost like it wasn't even Willem Dafoe. I mean, he he looks totally different. Yeah. Um, and he is opposite Robert Pattinson, mm-hmm. who I have always thought was a good actor, but was just in not so good movies. Yeah. Um, but because when people saw he was going to be like the new Batman, there was like a huge like fan outrage. And I was like, just give the guy a chance. I mean, like. Obviously, he knows what he's doing. Like you know, he's been in other stuff besides Twilight. Like I haven't seen a lot of his movies, but everything that I have seen that he's been in it, he's always been good. Mm. So I don't. And like, kind of this is like, I don't want to say like a passing the torch kind of thing, but it's kind of like the the seasoned guy is sort of like bringing in this other guy who has been typecast and all this stuff, and like. I don't know, it's sort of giving, like, validity to him, I guess. Yeah. Like, I don't I don't really know how to describe it, but... Yeah, I think that's fair. But yeah, they're both really good. Mm-hmm. They're both really good Oh, yeah, this. they're they're absolutely phenomenal. And I would say Willem Dafoe, just in and of his character, has a chance to shine a lot more than Robert Pattinson. Um, I think we should probably go over, like, a, a real quick plot synopsis, if people don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, go ahead. You got everything yeah, pulled up so, there, so yeah. So basically what's going on in the, in the movie is Willem Dafoe is, he's a wiki, so he watches over a lighthouse on a deserted island. Uh, he's been there for quite a while, or at least that's a sense you get from the movie. Um, I think they said he had, right? This was at least his second uh, stint being a wiki. Yeah. Um, if not more. So he's more seasoned, whereas Robert Pattinson is just coming, he's just learning to be a wiki, so he's just arriving at this lighthouse for the first time. Um, they're both stuck there for a month, I believe they say. Yeah, it was four weeks at yeah, first. Yeah, and it's just, the whole movie is just a descent into madness, and I really can't say anything more than that without giving things away, so keeping a spoiler free, it's just watching these two guys 
descend into madness and watching the world kind of crumble around them on this island alone. But because Willem Dafoe is more seasoned than Robert Pattinson, he's got more of that pirate personality. I think that's, that's safe to say. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's yeah. A, yeah. He's a swashbuckler. That one. Oh yeah. And he's, <laughs> he's certainly more ridiculous and. That's where I think he really got the opportunity to shine, whereas Robert Pattinson is fairly straight-laced, and not saying he wasn't incredible, because he was, he just didn't get the, his character wasn't set up to be as over-the-top as Willem Dafoe's character. Right, yeah, he's he's the straight man, and Willem Dafoe's like the crazy guy. Right. Um, Robert, he does have his moments, though, Robert Pattinson, especially um, towards the ending there, oh, yeah, where absolutely. he's got some time, oh, well, I, guess, I guess towards the beginning, too, he has some stuff uh, to do. Um, this, this also is not spoiler, um, but, uh, he has some scenes with a seagull (laughs) that, uh, yeah, he has some room to kind of do some stuff towards the beginning there. Oh yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, I got, what else did you, just off the top of your head, what are some of the things that really stood out to you besides like the performances, um, and how it was shot? I mean, I guess how it was shot, obviously, I mean, like. The camera work was really good, too, not just... Because, like, I thought it was going to be, like, a little more in the style of, like, a 50s film. Like, a lot of, like, static cam, right. stuff like that. But it's shot like a modern movie. Oh, yeah. It's just in black and white with an aspect ratio that you don't see too often anymore. It's not like, oh, they're setting up a tripod and there maybe there's some movement. But, no, like, the camera work in this is, like, what you would see in any other movie, basically. Yeah. It's not old school style so yeah the, it's, the camera work looks really good yeah it's incredibly shot i mean i thought it was a, a great looking movie i was afraid when i first saw trailers that the black and white would get a little gimmicky uh and i don't think it did i think it it, it fits so perfectly with the tone of the movie and it worked so well with uh it did some they did some real cool stuff with the the uh the format i don't know if you caught towards the beginning there's a uh, a scene transition where the uh, it's night and the the camera pans up to the sky in which the screen just goes completely black, and then it pans over as if going into a room. So it's like a seamless transition from the sky into a room. I don't know if you caught that. I did not. I, I thought didn't it was notice that. No. It was a real cool use of the the black and white kind of turning the entire screen black. I thought it was real interesting. No, I, I didn't notice that. Uh, a couple weeks ago, before Jared went on his treacherous journey. Um, we were talking about how I was excited to see the lighthouse and he said that he probably was not going to see it because he thought that it was going to be all style and no substance. Oh, he's missing. And I'm I'm here to say that that is not the case. Yeah. I I actually thought this movie, I had a feeling that it would be much more pretentious than it actually ended up being. Oh, it's not pretentious. It's not at all. I thought it was phenomenal. No, it's just shot. It's shot in an artsy style. Yeah. Like that's for sure. But it's not at no point during it. Did I feel like the director's like, I'm better than you. This is what I'm trying to say. This is the grand whatever. Like, sure, there are hidden meanings and stuff, but it's never like you're being looked down upon. Right. I guess. I think you can you get that sense for. And here's another thing that really surprised me with the movie. You get that sense just from a lot of the humor in it. And I found that the movie was surprisingly funny. There were some moments that had me laughing out loud. I thought it was. It was just a blast of a movie. I mean, I enjoyed every second of it. Yeah, I don't know if I laughed out loud at all, but there were definitely some jokes in there. Like, I don't think you can call a movie pretentious if, like, four or five times in the movie you're having fart jokes. Oh, yeah. yeah so, I yeah, like, I don't I don't think it was pretentious at all. It was just in an artistic style. And, I mean, like, you know what you're getting into going in. I mean, like, if you're going into a movie that is shot in 2019 in black and white... Like, you just kind of have to accept the fact that it's going to be, like, artsy at parts. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what people would expect with that. So, um, yeah, the direction was good, obviously, um, besides the camera work. There's really, like, a, a lot of the acting has to do with actors, but a lot of that has to do with the director as well, having telling them what to do and how to get those performances out um and melding that good with camera movements and stuff i mean there was a lot of scenes i guess the lighthouse itself like the lighthouse was constructed specifically for this movie it wasn't like an existing one. Oh wow so i guess like you really have a lot of freedom like you said doing transitions where you're moving through rooms and stuff i remember like when robert pattinson is going into the lighthouse for the first time it's like essentially like a one-take shot mm. where it's going through 
the different rooms. And I don't know how much of that set they had to be like swapping out and stuff for like the one takes. But yeah, it was really cool. I was curious about that. How, just out of curiosity, I don't know a whole lot about the actual filming process. How do they film one take shots like that? Like you've got to have essentially an open wall on the side, right? Yeah. I mean, it depends on where you're at. A lot of the one take shots that I have been a part of, um, it's all been outside. (laughs) So we haven't had to worry about, uh, set deconstruction and stuff. There's this clip online and I forget what series it was, but it it was that thing with, uh, Jim Carrey, like that Netflix show where he's like a kid's host. Yeah. And they did like this insane one take where it's in a living room like this, but it's supposed to like take place. I like through a, a substantial amount of time. So, like, the camera's moving, and behind them, there's just, like, hundreds of people moving the sets around and, like, putting up Christmas decorations, and, like, it's, like, insane. Hill House had one. One of the, uh... Oh, episode six, brother. Yeah, had, like, 17 minutes. (laughs) One, yeah, one shot. But I noticed that, and it reminded me the that part you're talking about, right, when he gets in there, and they're kind of panning rooms, reminded me of Hereditary a lot, because Hereditary makes use of that a lot with the whole dollhouse idea. Yeah. And I got that feel from this as well, which I really liked. I really appreciated that. Yeah. Um, I guess what else can we talk about that's not a spoiler? Um, If you look on the IMDb page, um, you see that there's actually a third credited cast member. There is a mermaid. So I guess that is not really a spoiler. Um, So there's some weird stuff going on with that, which we'll get into later. Um, I guess one thing I will say... That I don't want to say is like a negative, but I thought it was actually going to be slightly crazier than it was. Like, I don't I don't know. I don't know what I was expecting, but I remember thinking like, oh, like that wasn't that wasn't as wild as I thought it would be at the end. Not in like a bad way, but I just thought, I don't know. Yeah, I think they, they kind of held back a little bit, but I almost <laughs> like that they did uh, because it makes it feel I don't want to say more real, but essentially more real. Uh, they could have really gone a lot wilder, and they didn't. They kind of held back, but I, I appreciated that from it. Um, I will also say, and I, I'm not saying this is a negative, it's not as much of a horror as I was expecting necessarily. Like, I would certainly classify it as a horror, but I, I there was never a part where I felt, like, scared necessarily, and I never felt, like, uh, uncomfortable in any sense. It was It was a very straightforward movie for the most part i mean it didn't find it scary at any time yeah i will i will say this i i did not find it scary at all but that does not mean that it's not interesting agreed no, I, I, like um yeah i mean you you would have to classify it as a horror fantasy mm-hmm. film slash like drama but yeah it's not like shit your pants scary or anything it's just no. sort of has a foreboding atmosphere just like a creepy mood throughout yeah dark uh, tone yeah you get the kind of the the horror setting there's definitely kind of a um almost an eeriness in the sense where you don't really know what's coming next but i would never call it scary and i don't mean that to take anything away from it because this might have been my favorite film of the year i loved midsummer but this was phenomenal yeah i mean this i don't know if it was my favorite of the year this is my favorite horror film of the year for sure Um, but I don't know. I don't know if anything is going to take over once upon a time in Hollywood for me. (laughs) That's just how it is. That's fair. That was a real good one. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was really good. Um, I guess besides that, I mean, I don't know what to say that isn't going to give away a crap ton. So if you have not seen the movie, this is your chance to pause the video, go see it, um, and come back. Yeah, and I highly recommend seeing it if you can. Uh, A24 films tend to have, tend to be a huge pain in the ass to see because they don't they don't always get national releases. Uh, we luckily had one about, that's what, 10, 15 minutes from both of us? Yeah, 10, 15 minutes away from both of us. We went to um, a slightly better theater than we were originally going to. I don't think, I think maybe like three or four theaters got it around here. One of them, because I watched his review today, Chris Stuckman went to one at a Cinemark, like, near yeah, us. Yeah, I saw that in Cleveland. <laughs> I was like, damn. <laughs> I have, well, my boss actually lives in Akron, and he was looking, he was looking to see the movie, so I've, I've kind of had an eye on if it's playing in Akron, and it's not. It's only playing in the Cleveland area, from what I can tell, so. Yeah. I've had to make the drive, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 
yeah, so go see it. Um, if you happen to be listening to this, like, around Christmas time, I'm sure it's on demand by now or on Blu-ray or whatever. So yeah. go check it out, and we'll be back after these messages. <laughs> Are you tired of plain old breakfast? Cereal is not sugary enough. Are you tired of burnt pancakes and waffles? Then you need slapjacks. The slap gets your face and it causes a chemical reaction to heat off. No cooking required, just slap and eat. Don't believe us? Here's a satisfied customer. Slapjacks are the best breakfast food ever made. Slapjacks, slap those smiles back. <laughs> You heard of your kids. Slapjack saves lives. Order at www.slapjacks.com. Okay, we are back. Um, time to get into some spoiler territory. So, Al, why don't you start us off here? Oh, God, I don't even know where to start with this one. There's, there's a lot going on. One of the things I found about this movie is this movie tends to get really, really... I don't want to say sloppy, but like looking back, it's hard to remember what happened when. There's, I don't know if you felt this way too, there's a lot of scenes in this movie, and a lot of them that go by rather quickly, so there's a lot of, like, location changes and different kind of things to keep an eye on. Um, where should we start with this one? So immediately after, uh, after getting to the island on the first night, or it might have actually even been the first day, uh, Robert Pattinson's character, who we find out is named Ephraim Winslow in the beginning... Uh, yeah. <laughs> he finds a a small, I guess it's a statue, a figurine. Yeah, a it's like a little trinket in a mattress. Yeah, it's it's buried inside of his mattress, and from what I gather now, that has to have been intentionally placed there. Don't know for what purpose, and that's that's one of the things that kind of confuses me. But that that statue tends to stick with him, and he tends to go back to it quite a bit. He pleasures himself too. Yeah, that's essentially <laughs> like that's like the sex symbol of the movie. It's in, in a weird way. I don't know how to describe what exactly that would be, but um, uh, yeah, he uses that quite a bit. Yeah, um, and it's it's in the shape of a mermaid, which we do see a mermaid a few times in this. Um, and mermaids, like in mythology and stuff, they're sort of like sirens or like succubuses, as they're called. They're essentially bring they lure men in and they bring bad luck and death and all that. It's not not Ariel the Little Mermaid type shit. It's like much more sinister than that. Um, and we get the first time we see the mermaid, or maybe it's the second time, she's like on this rock and she just like I don't know what the word like it's like a screech and that that was kind of disturbing. Like that part. Was, yeah, that was the well, second time. The first time he sees her, it's in that uh, it's in a dream, and I think he's swimming with it. Then. Yeah, th that's yeah. one of my favorite shots of the movie, and I mean, it's in the trailer too, where Robert Pattinson's like headed towards the camera, like in the water. Yeah, like that is like straight out of like a fifties like horror movie. Like that shot's great. Um, yeah, so he sees this mermaid, and he has fantasies about it. Uh, we see some mermaid vagina, I guess you would call it. I don't, I don't really know what. It, I don't know how, I mean, that's what it is. I don't know how to yeah. say it more eloquently, but yeah, that, that stuff's kind of weird. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we get, and then through the, through the beginning of the movie, the relationship between uh, Robert Pattinson's character, Ephraim Winslow, and Willem Dafoe's character, Thomas Wake, the relationship's a little bit strained. It almost seems like uh, Willem Dafoe's character, Thomas, is like throwing his power around because he's, he's having Robert Pattinson essentially do everything. And the jobs are pretty terrible jobs from what you see, what you could see. He's uh, cleaning chamber pots. Yeah. Uh, he's lugging the oil up to the top of the lighthouse to keep the lighthouse lit, the, the giant kerosene oil. He's reshingling roofs. He's kind of doing everything. He's painting the side oh, of yeah, the lighthouse. He's painting, yeah. Uh, while, uh, while, well, essentially Willem Dafoe is watching and he's tending after the, the lighthouse, which you find out is a, a pretty weird thing going on at night. He'll see him up at the top by the light, just kind of standing there naked in front of it. <laughs> it's real bizarre. Uh, so Willem Dafoe's character also doesn't allow Robert Pattinson's character to really see the light. He won't let him up in the, uh, the I don't know what you'd call that, the, the chamber at the top of the lighthouse? Yeah, where the actual light is kept on the top of the lighthouse, whatever that's called. He keeps it locked, and he keeps the key on him. 
And uh, as as time goes on, you can tell uh, Ephraim Winslow really he really wants to see what's going on up there. He really wants to see what exactly uh, Willem Dafoe's character is doing. Um, you can tell at first. So Ephraim Winslow is not a talker at all. You get that pretty right. early on. They sit down for dinner every night, and Willem Dafoe... He does a toast yeah, every night. He does a toast every night. He tells that, what is it, you'd call it a prayer, I guess? I don't know, it's kind of a, it's kind of like a saying. Yeah, it's like a kind of, sailor's, yeah, like... Yeah, like a sailor's prayer, but... And Robert Pattinson's character doesn't seem to want to talk much at all. They make very awkward conversation to start. Um, yeah, just, just... Yeah. Basically reprimanding him for things he did wrong, and, uh... Little like sailor tales, so he, he tells him about like not harming birds after uh, yeah. he tells him about the bird that has been bothering him. And... Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's one of the things that they're talking about. He's, I don't want to say like bestowing knowledge, but he's telling like old like stories, like legends, and like I, I don't know if legend would be a world, but just like old like pirate stories, like myths, like it's bad luck to kill a seagull because it has like the soul of a sailor who's passed in it. And I uh, tells him like some other stories. And I think at one point, Robert Pattinson's basically like, oh, you're talking bullshit. Yeah. And fucking Willem Dafoe smacks him and it's like, don't kill a seagull. Yeah. And like, so he's like all ridiculous. You brought this up a little bit earlier, but I think one of the funniest shots in the entire movie, and I don't know if it was supposed to be funny or not. And I don't know if, I, cause I know Emily didn't notice it. I had to tell her about it, but when Willem Dafoe's n- naked up on, the thing in the lighthouse is going before you see him and like Robert Pattons is doing his work, but every once in a while you see like the light of the lighthouse, like go by and cast the shadow, and, but, yeah. like the shadow. Of Willem Dafoe yeah, I, I, was, I was like, Oh my God. I was like, yeah. cause like it builds anticipation is all right. He's going to be standing there naked probably. Yeah. And then it cuts to it and he's up there. So I'm going to say it's a little bit hard to retell this movie scene by scene so i don't think i really want to keep doing that if that makes sense yeah i kind of want to just hit the more major points so later in the movie and i think the first real kind of turning point uh robert pattinson's character and willem dafoe's character start actually talking a lot more and uh robert pattinson's character ephraim he to this point willem dafoe had not been calling him by name and I, sorry, by the way, that I keep switching between character name and actor name. It's just, probably a little yeah. easier to use actor because it's going to get more confusing as we go on. But uh, so Willem Dafoe has called him, what does he call him, Lad? He, he, I think he called him Lad throughout the movie. Yeah, something like that. And Robert Pattinson, he's fed up with everything and he, he kind of yells at him, tells him to call him by his name, which is Winslow. Uh, and then they, they eventually end up kind of talking more and they, te- they tend to like open up a bit more. Yeah, they they start talking a little bit more, and he's asking him like, "Oh, why does he want to be a wiki? Like, why does he? Why is he here? Basically." And he says that he's just been moving from job to job. This job pays well. Blah 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 blah. So Willem Dafoe kind of gets the sense that this guy has done something in his past that he's trying to hide from. And I mean, we see that in the trailer as well because he's like on the run, <laughs> like yeah, whatever. But you also get but, so you get two things from the scene, and one of them. Uh, so Willem Dafoe's character mentions that the other wiki before Robert Pattinson, uh, died on the job and he says that it was, at, he, he passed away after losing his sanity. So we don't really know what happens to him and we, I don't think it ever really explains that, does it? No, it doesn't kind of really explain it. it no. But like, they never really say what happens and I think this is also where, maybe I'm wrong, Robert Pattinson explains what happened to his old coworker here, right? Or is that I, I think that's a little bit later. Okay. Um, but yeah, basically Robert Pattinson says that, oh, he, when he was working in Canada as like a timber person, basically someone went in the chipper or something. Yeah. And it's kind of implied that either Robert Pattinson did it or he saw it happen and didn't help or something. Like, I don't. Yeah, that's in a later scene. And what I will say about that scene and what I love that they did is... Later on, Willem Dafoe actually accuses him of killing him, which was effectively, like, voicing a fan theory. And I thought that was a really, really cool idea. Like, he's essentially saying what the audience is thinking there. I thought that was really, really cool. It was a nice little nod to to everything. Um, I really appreciated that aspect of it. Yeah. 
And I mean, who knows? I mean, Willem Dafoe could have done something to bring about the demise of the other, like, wiki apprentice or whatever. So, like, really, like, both of these characters, like, it's not like we have a good guy or a bad guy. We just sort of have two question guys. Marks. Yeah, two question <laughs> marks. There's a lot of gray area. Yeah. Because, I mean, the film's in black and white. There's a lot of gray area. But, yeah, like, these guys, like, we don't, we don't know who to root for in this. I mean, I guess you would say Pattinson. I don't I guess. Know. So, I, I mean, I don't know. The movie's so hazy, and the one thing that I will say about this film is it is very abstract in the sense where there's no real... Like, there's so many questions after seeing the movie that they don't they don't explain, and they really don't even hint at. Like, there's so much that's left to interpretation, which I really appreciated. I thought that was pretty well done. Um, but, like, if you're a person who doesn't like kind of open-ended movies, you probably won't like this too much. Although you're probably a little bit late for that. So yeah. They're, they're in spoilers, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, it does get a little bit weird. There's a lot of not knowing what's real and what's not real. Um, Everything kind of changes. The last night that they're there, um, Robert Pattinson's character, who he had been refusing to drink every time they toasted, and he would just switch to drinking water. But on the final night, he ended up actually drinking, and he and Willem Dafoe both got really drunk. There was a lot of goofy scenes of them dancing and them singing, and then they, they actually miss... I don't know if they missed her. I don't know if nobody came to pick them up, but the next day, nobody comes for them. And they're essentially, from that point on, they're stuck. And that's just kind of where they are. And then shit gets really crazy after that. Yeah. That's when things start getting really wild. And I no longer had any clue what was real, what wasn't. They kind of flashed to so much going on that it was just, it, it was wild. Yeah, they don't really explain it, but I had like read online that, people had said that Defoe intentionally gets him drunk so that they miss the boat. But then again, it it is like storming and stuff. So the boat couldn't have may not have come regardless, you know? Yeah, I could see that. Um, but I feel like we have to go back and address one thing that we didn't address at all. And that's the seagull. Oh Um, yeah. yeah. Again, I'm really struggling on how to, how to lay this out. Cause there's so many beats that we're missing just in the sense where yeah. it's, it's hard to keep everything straightened, but, and it's hard to remember what happened at one point during right. the movie as well. But basically, yeah, like the seagull, like we'd mentioned, it had been like screwing with them every once in a while, like laughing at it. And it had one eye. Did you notice that? Yeah. It, had, it was a missing an eye. Um, but basically like we see a few scenes where Robert Pattinson's trying to do his work and the seagulls coming and like laughing at him essentially. So eventually he snaps and he just sort of grabs it and starts smacking it and then kills it. And that's what supposedly brings about all the bad luck in this. Um, And it also has to do with the climax, which we'll get to at the end. But, um, but I, I mean, unless you want to just get into it. I mean, we're already in spoilers. We're going to jump all over the place, but that's, yeah. that's the only way to do it. I do want to quickly say that with, I don't know if you noticed, but the one eye thing, there's a scene in it where uh, one of Robert Pattinson's jobs is to check the pots every day for crabs or whatever they're catching in, in, the, yeah. in the pots. And at one point, he pulls up a pot that has uh, the, head, the head of his former co-worker. In it, and his former coworker is also missing an eye. I don't yeah. know if you caught that. I like, noticed yeah. that, but I, I didn't know what it was supposed to mean. Yeah, but. I saw some symbolism with that. It's a connection with the uh, the bird there. Thought that was that was interesting, but um, yeah, I, I do get one of the, the themes that runs throughout this. I think is uh, there's a lot of guilt for Robert Pattinson's character, and whether he did it or not. I mean, one of the first things he sees, and like it's like the first day there, is he sees all the logs washing on shore. Yeah. Which is an obvious <clears throat> nod to his former job as a timberman. Yeah. Yeah, right when they first land, they're, yeah. they're also bringing in a bunch of logs uh, on the shore. Yeah. Oh, and also, we didn't mention it, but uh, Ephraim Winslow is not his real name. As we learn, that is the name of the person who had died in the wood chipper. His real name is what? Thomas yeah, something? Yeah, it's Tom. Let me see if I can find it on here. They call him Tom. So there was Tom and Thomas. Yeah. Which that's where I said earlier, if we call him by name, it's Thomas Howard. Yeah, Thomas um, Howard. If we call him by name, it's going to get really confusing because it's Thomas Howard and Thomas Wake. Yeah. But right after that, uh, right after that scene is actually the, the spilling your beans scene. Yeah. Because that's where he spills his beans. Yeah, why did you spill your beans? <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically he confesses to 
everything, and yeah. The whole, like, it's so hard to just talk about this movie, because, like, and plus, like, we don't even know what is real and what, because, I mean, like, Robert Pattinson's, like, imagining shit, they're drunk for a lot of it. Um, there's dreams. I mean, there was a dream with the the with the, the mermaid. There's a lot of scenes that just end, and then all of a sudden they're waking up on a floor somewhere or something. So there's a lot of like yeah. random cuts back to reality. So I I don't. It is really hard to keep straight what's real and what's not. Um, I think there were some some really really great scenes when everything started to get wild. One of the scenes I really loved is there's a scene where Robert Pattinson wants to get into the top of the lighthouse. And he, so he climbs up to the top while Willem Dafoe is sleeping. He realizes it's locked, and then he goes to grab the key. And uh, the, the key's on Willem Dafoe. He's, like, got it while he's sleeping, and he goes to steal it from him. And he, like, wrapped his shoes in cloth or something so they wouldn't make sound as he's, as he's walking. Yeah, he, like, because he knew if he woke him yeah. up when he was trying to get the keys, it was not going to be good. And he wakes, he accidentally wakes up Willem Dafoe. He actually pulls a knife on him and is going to kill him, and Willem Dafoe just wakes up. And I, I, I laughed so hard at this scene. He's, <laughs> he's not alarmed. He just, like, looks back at him, and I, he says something like, it's a queer way you're wearing your shoes. And I, <laughs> I laughed so hard at that line. I thought that was so good. And there, there were a few other lines in the movie that, that made me laugh pretty hard, but that was the one that really got me. Yeah. Um, there were, I don't know want to say... I have like homoerotic moments or something. Like I don't know how oh, you ha- how you how you some, would say it. But. Some kind of gay moments. That's that's. I think there was. I think that was a whole theme kind of riding in this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I thought it it, it was a. There's a lot going on. <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of different kind of themes going on through this. But yeah, there was certainly some some feelings between the two of them. Yeah. And uh, like, we don't know like their backstories and stuff. I think it just has to do with the fact that they're the only people there. Yeah. That's kind of what I get um, into. Yeah. So I don't know if there's really too much to read into with that, but I don't, the whole thing is just so strange, <laughs> like the whole movie. Um, so who knows? I mean, they could, they could be some secrets there. Yeah. It's strange, but it, it was, such a blast of a movie. I find my, I found myself smiling throughout most of the movie. Just most of the scenes were just so entertaining. Yeah, and I, I genuinely enjoyed it so much. But it starts getting really weird. Um, you kind of stop realizing what's real and what's not. Like we said, um, I did notice. I don't know if you caught this. They made it pretty obvious, but they actually at some point are drinking kerosene. Yes. <laughs> instead of like drinking, which I thought was. Uh, interesting as they're kind of being i guess taken over by their work yeah um i will say like at no point during this movie was i bored yeah um i like at the beginning i could see it maybe taking like a minute to get in because there's a lot of time where you're just watching robert pattinson walk around like with a wheelbarrow or something but at no point in this was like even though it's like leisurely paced there's never a point that's dull at all yeah I wouldn't say the pacing felt slow at first, um, but it didn't feel like I thought the witch's pacing was really, really slow and it was a a real slow burner. This felt that way for about 45 minutes, but then the last hour, hour and 10 minutes I felt was moving so fast, which I, (laughs) I didn't mind. Like I didn't think there was a problem with the pace, but like we said earlier, there's, there's so much that happens in the last like hour of this movie, and it's moving so quick as it gets just really, really wild. And I really appreciated the kind of the ramp up of the pace. Yeah, I mean, the more insane they get, the pace gets more insane. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it really like sort of puts you like you feel like you're trapped on there with them uh, at some points in this. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's really good like keeping up the like dreary mood throughout the entire movie like even like as soon as they get there and like to the end like there's never like even when there's jokes and stuff like there's still like moments uh like i don't even know how to describe it like even when there's parts goofing around you kind of have the feeling like all right well now what's gonna happen yeah you know and i it's hard to describe it in words how you feel when you're watching it but that's how it feels i guess um, right. I think we should probably talk about the ending real quick and then, um, we can go back and touch things that we may have missed throughout. Like, I, I, I'm sorry that it's been so hard to really, 
yeah. define this. It's a very, very perplexed. Like, it's, it's very hard to recall exactly what happened when, and it's hard to just talk about small parts without kind of moving forward. Right. And, I mean, we've only seen this once. I mean, yeah. we just saw it the other night. Um, so it's not like we really have studied the film too greatly here to remember what happens beat by beat. Right. It's just kind of our recollection of what's going on. So, yeah, in the ending, um, it's sort of foreshadowed early on with the seagulls that you're not supposed to screw with them. And at this point, uh, Robert Pattinson has, he's basically fed up everything going on. There's a huge power struggle between him, Willem Dafoe. Um, There's the only scene in the movie that I did not like and thought was really stupid was the whole like bark like a dog thing and where he's like walking him outside like i thought that was pretty dumb that was a little a little <laughs> weird i will but, say there's a scene right before that where uh robert pattinson is being chased by willem dafoe he's trying to get to a boat to just leave on the boat and willem dafoe's character smashes the boat with an axe and just completely destroys it and then they end up going back inside and through after a struggle willem dafoe kind of turns the tables and he's he's gaslighting completely and he says that Robert Pattinson was chasing him, and he destroyed the boat. Yeah. And, wow, uh, I don't know if it was gaslighting, or I don't know if that's actually what happened. It's yeah, kind of we, like, that's not explained either. Yeah, you lose all perception of what was real there, and it's it's almost like they gaslighted us, because I, I don't yeah. know what the hell happened there. Yeah. But, but I thought that was really, really clever and really well done. Yeah, because yeah, it reminded me, like, of Joker, um, which you saw, obviously. Yeah. Like... Where there's that moment where Joker's sitting in her apartment and she's like, "Oh, who the hell are you?" Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we uh, and, do you want to spoil Joker in a we different, are, in a we different are, review. I already spoiled Joker in the podcast before this, brother. Well, just just a quick heads up if you haven't listened to that one. <laughs> this is a Joker spoiler. So yeah. Heads up. But yeah, it's kind of like that same thing where like you're led to believe this one thing throughout a time, and then Willem Dafoe comes in and he's like, "Oh, what are you talking about? You destroyed the boat on me." So that could have been what was going on or it could just be Willem Dafoe like screwing with him. Right. And I don't know which it was. And I, I like that. I like how disoriented I felt the whole movie with not knowing what was going on. Um, at the end of the day. So right after that, uh, Robert Pattinson kills Willem Dafoe's character. Yeah. And then was it right after? Oh, he goes up to the lighthouse. He ends up unlocking the top of the lighthouse. He, goes to the actual light, which opens like automatically without him touching it, and he stares into it. He seems to be awestruck by it. They never show what's inside of it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's like the Pulp Fiction thing. Right. You never see what's in the briefcase. Or the box in Seven. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and then all of a sudden the screen flashes, and he's lying in essentially a pit, right? Like That was like a giant pit where I think where the lighthouse was. Right, yeah, he's, like, outside Yeah, he's now. outside naked on some rocks, and there's seagulls just eating him alive. Yeah. And then it ends, and that's just where the movie stops. And they don't really explain what's going on there, but that was that was the ending. Yeah, that's... The, like I said, if you're coming to this movie looking for answers, you're not going to get it. Um, if you want an ending that where everything everything you watch is explained and everything comes together, this is not the kind of movie for that. Um, I, I don't know if you haven't... Did you read up at all in any of like the mythology and stuff that like this is referencing? Yeah, a little bit. There was... Um, there's actually... Ironically, there used to be... If you go to Wikipedia page, at the end it says seagulls peck at his innards and it used to be linked to a greek uh, greek god page. Yeah, it was... I, was I, I, I forget what it, the god's name was, but it's basically the god that took fire down from Olympus and gave it to the uh, humans, essentially. Mm -hmm. So basically, like, they're saying that, like, referencing that the light in the lighthouse is fire, but then since he saw the fire and since he has access to it, in the mythology, basically this god is chained to, like, a rock and, like, a vulture or something, like, eats his innards every day or something. And since he's a god, it, like, comes back, and this repeats on a cycle forever. Okay. But that's basically... And I guess, like, Willem Dafoe is, like, a reference to, like, this... It's, like, the son of Poseidon or something. And, yeah, so that was his character represents. Or it could not represent any of this. It's all everyone's interpretation of it. So. Yeah, yeah, this totally is up for interpretation. Um, now that we've 
really, really sloppily kind of summed up what <laughs> happens in this film. Um, what were your, were there any scenes we didn't talk about that you really liked? Was there anything that we, we missed that you, you liked a lot? I've got a few that, like, few scenes that I really, really thought were great that we didn't get a chance to discuss yet. Um, nothing really, like, comes to mind, like, specifically. Um, I mean, just anything where Willem Dafoe is giving a ridiculous speech is a highlight. That's gonna um. be mine. So, he had a <laughs> soliloquy at one point where he went off for... It has to have been two or three minutes straight. Just and he did not like, blink the entire time no, as well. No like blinking. Talking about Neptune and asking Neptune to strike him dead. And I don't know if you noticed, and maybe I, maybe this isn't actually how it was, but it looked like the picture was getting sharper as it was going. Like it looked like it was going from kind of the quality of the movie had been to really, really getting sharp as it was like panning in on his face. I don't know if you caught that, but that's that's it looked like that to me. Oh, maybe. I mean, I don't know. It might have just been whatever lens they were using when you get that close or something. I'm not exactly sure. But but, but. it was... That was a <laughs> was a phenomenal scene. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wonder how many takes that took them. Because he really, really nailed it there, and I would imagine that's a pain in the ass to film. Yeah. Is he a method actor, do you know? I don't know. Because he's... Just, like, every movie I see him and he's always going off on these tangents and shit, and... He's completely over the top in the best way in a lot of them. I would imagine but, he is, but... Yeah, so... Yeah, that scene was great. There was also that scene towards the end where... Uh, or, I guess towards the middle. I also loved the scene where um, Robert Pattinson's character is just kind of exploding on him. Like, just berating him and saying essentially all... He's, like, releasing all the pent-up rage he's had this whole time that they live there... And he mentioned something about how if he could have a steak right now, it would be, <laughs> yeah. He says he would fuck the steak, actually. And he also takes a slam at Willem Dafoe's cooking. Yeah, that scene's hilarious. And Willem Dafoe gets He's like, you very, don't like what I cook for supper. <laughs> yeah, he gets, he gets very offended by that. And he, like, almost cries about it. Like, yeah. yeah, I thought it was hilarious. And then after that whole scene, uh, Robert Pattinson admits that he does like his cooking. Which I yeah. thought was funny. yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that is one of the chores Willem Dafoe has. He does the, he does do the cooking. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I don't know if that's on the same level as dangling off the side of the lighthouse attempting to paint it while there are seagulls around, and Willem Dafoe, of all people, is holding you up, a frail old man. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not on that level, but... Right. Um, what were some of your other favorites? Uh, let me try to think of some other scenes that happened. Yeah, it's just like... So, like, a lot of it, like, blends together. Because, I mean, like, the whole thing takes place in the lighthouse. I mean, there's a couple scenes, like, outside. But, I mean, like, the entire thing sort of, like, melds together, so. Yeah, it's it's really hard to recall everything as it happened. There was this, there was a real, there was that scene where he first sees the, um, the locked door. It was, like, one of the first scenes where he sees that locked cage. Yeah. And there's, like, there's, like, a kraken up there with him, the tentacle scene. But that's also the semen scene. Yeah. That was kind of gross. There's like, uh, I don't even really know what was happening there. <laughs> Willem Dafoe was up there naked, and I don't know if he was like masturbating or if he was having sex with a crack. I don't know what the fuck was happening there. Yeah, it was very bizarre. But there's like semen dripping down and almost landing on Robert Pattinson, and he's just kind of standing there like staring up at it. Yeah. That was certainly a weird one. Yeah. And, again, and, like, we don't even know, because I guess, like, we're seeing the movie through Pattinson's perspective, because, like, we're following him through a lot of it. There's no real scenes where it's, like, just a foe. Right. Like, there's a couple, but, like, Robert Pattinson's basically in the whole thing. So we're kind of, like, in his headspace, so we don't know what he's imagining and what is actually happening, I guess. Yeah. So, because, like, there's a couple times when we see Defoe and he's, like, completely turned into, like, a sea monster. Oh, that was <laughs> during their fight. So they got in a fist fight towards the end, and it was it was a little bit before uh, Pattinson ends up killing Defoe. And they're, as they're fighting, there's a flash where Willem Defoe's character turns into uh, Ephraim Winslow, so the, the guy that died on accident or that uh, Robert Pattinson killed. Don't really know which one. But he, like, turns into him, and then shortly after, there's, like, a full Kraken behind him. Yeah. Like, there's... It's, <laughs> yeah. It's wild. And that's... You might have seen... That was in a trailer, actually. That's one of the trailers I saw. 
I saw that, and I was real interested in the fact that, oh, shit, there's a crack in this movie. And there, there really wasn't, but I thought that scene was really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't really know what else to to say. Was there? I already mentioned the portion of it that I didn't like, and that was really the only part of it that I thought kind of sucked. But uh, was there anything in it at all that you didn't really like? Um, I don't think so, honestly. I mean, I thought everything in it I thought was was so well done and seemed to fit so well. Um, there was not a point that I was bored. I was a little bit afraid going in. I was I was a bit tired, like going to the theater, and I was afraid that I was going that it was going to drone at times. And I really didn't think it did. Even the beginning, where it was kind of just them doing chores and stuff, like I, I it was surprisingly entertaining to me. There were also a lot of like weird shots. Like there was that shot of them just standing into the camera. Oh like, yeah, I mean, like I, mean I mean, I mean, the lighthouse that like they <laughs> yeah. felt like they were just made for trailer shots almost. But I the I guess one thing that I did not like the trailer shots in this are super obvious. Yeah, they are. And I don't know if that's just because the trailer was like so well done, but like whenever you're like sitting there watching it, you're like, okay, that was a shot from the trailer. That was a shot from the trailer. Yeah, the shot from the poster. Yeah. There's like the shot that I always saw for the poster of them both staring like they're in front of the lighthouse and they're both just kind of blank face staring. It looks like like a picture from the 1900s. From the early yeah. 1900s. And they're just like standing, like that shot goes on for like a minute. They're just like standing yeah. there like staring at the camera. Um, the, like, the one that's, like, super obvious, where he's like, how long have we been on this rock? Yeah. Five days? It's like, all right, that's a trailer shot. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and it's not, because, like, some trailers, like, they'll have lines, but there's other stuff that is going on. But in the trailer, it's literally the same exact shot that you see in the movie. Yeah. It's, like, him shit sitting there. So, I don't know, that was a little, like, distracting. But I guess if you haven't seen the trailer, like, you would never notice that, but... Well, what I'll also say is the trailer, while there's a lot of shots from the trailer that are pretty obvious... The trailer certainly doesn't ruin anything about this movie. Oh, no, no, so, not at all. Yeah, that's always a thing I'm afraid of with horror movies. Is I'm afraid of, like, oh, the best moments are usually in the trailers or the real big moments. Like, that wasn't a thing in this movie. I felt, like, I, I felt completely thrown off the entire movie. I had no clue what was coming next. And at the end of the day, like, yeah, there were a lot of shots that I recognized from the trailers, but they didn't give away everything. There was a lot of scenes that... Sport in trailers. Speaking of that, this reminded me because I just saw this at work. You've seen Toy Story 4, right? Yeah. Okay, so like literally we're playing a Toy Story 4 trailer at work and it shows the last shot of the movie, like Woody like oh, no. saying bye. Oh, and it's no. like, how are you putting this in the trailer? He's like, he's like, see you so long, partner. I was like, what the hell? I I mean, I guess if you haven't seen the movie and you have no context, you don't know what that is. But it's just like, why would you put that in there? I don't know. That's another good movie, by the way. Oh, yeah, it was good. Um, But yeah, that's a whole nother discussion. (laughs) Um, But yeah, that came out this year, too. That was another that was in my top 10 of this year. Yeah, for sure. Definitely make mine, too. Um, I enjoyed it quite a bit, but. Yeah, I don't know what else there's to say about the lighthouse. I'm sure we missed some things, and I'm sure that there's uh, there's big parts that we didn't talk about. But it's it's just hard to keep everything straight. And I I didn't really realize before going into a plot summary how <laughs> how vague the summary how, would be. How disorienting the the task of kind of retelling this movie would be. But that's that's the best I could do. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean. I liked it. Uh, on my letterbox, I gave it three and a half stars, um, which generally means that I liked it a lot. Um, I r- very rarely give something any more than four. Um, I only have a couple five stars. Those are meant for like my most favorite movies like ever. I don't know. Like what would what would you kind of rate it? I guess. I mean, I gave it three and a half out of five. But uh, I don't know. Are you on Letterboxd? I am. I haven't updated mine for a while, and I've, I've missed a lot of things. My letterbox would end up being, like, 90% horror films. Yeah. Um, I should update it, and I probably will. I'm I'm bad at scoring things, and I, I have a feeling I'm much more positive than a lot of people are. I tend to like things more than I dislike things. This would honestly probably be, like, a four and a half, maybe a five to me. I don't hold five as holy as you do, I yeah, guess, I, to where, yeah. like... There's a handful of things that would get a five from me, but I, I really do think this is a phenomenal movie. Um, like I said, this might be my movie of the year. It's it's a strong toss-up between this and Midsummer, but I think there was more that I enjoyed consistently throughout this movie than Midsummer. Midsummer did have some parts, admittedly, that felt like they droned a little bit, and this movie felt interesting and exciting the entire time. 
So I, I really enjoyed this movie. I, I'm very excited to watch it again. I might go see it in theaters again. I'm trying to decide whether I should or not, uh, but I, I certainly want to see this again because I think I, I needs another watching. Yeah, depending on how long it's in theaters around here. I mean, who knows? It could be done by Friday. Yeah. I mean, we don't. I don't really know. Especially with A24. A24's films are always kind of weird to see, and they tend to have... Some of them have real quick turnaround times. Like, I was just looking up The Death of Dick Long. I don't know if you've heard of that, but they, they released a movie that's essentially like a dark comedy, uh-huh. and it looked phenomenal, and I, I wanted to see it really bad. It got... A very very limited release, and it came nowhere anywhere yeah. near here. Um, but I was looking it up. That was only like a month ago, and I was looking it up. It's already streaming on like, <laughs> it's not streaming, but you can rent it on Amazon or iTunes already. So I'm, I'm probably gonna check that out. Yeah, the Lighthouse might have a quick turnaround like that. I could certainly see that being the case. Um, I don't even know if it'll get a physical release because a lot of their movies don't. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, it has two really big names in it. And which is probably why our theaters around here got it. Because, um, like, I know when they put out, like, 8th grade and mid-90s and stuff, like, it came out nowhere that I wanted to see. And both of those are out on eighth DVD. 8th grade was in Cedar Lee. I almost went and saw it, actually. Yeah. I just didn't get around to it because Cedar Lee's a bit of a hike, admittedly, from here. But Yeah. Yeah, but both of those are on Blu-ray now, so I would imagine The Lighthouse is going to be soon. I don't know if it will be by the end of this year. But, um, yeah. It would definitely be in my... Top 10 of the year, top 5 of the year for sure. Um, it would be in my top 10 modern classics list if we had made it yeah. today. Oh yeah, it, um, it would certainly crack my list. It'd probably be pretty high up there. And I think this is a movie that's going to stand the test of time. I think it'll be like kind of in the same vein as The Witch, where it's a very unique movie that's uh, it's just different from everything they're releasing today. And I, I think it is going to hold its place in horror movie history. Yeah, and it's not just the way that it's shot that makes it stand out. I mean, obviously, that makes it stand out. It's in black and white. But, I mean, even, like, the subject matter and the plot are, like, things that you don't really see too often. The one thing I will say, like, and I thought about this a lot, and this is something that no one other than me and the very few people that watch the videos on my channel would understand, but there's this movie from Scotland called The Unkindness of Ravens, which is a movie about a guy who was isolated, who goes insane, and has visions of ravens, and at one point they're, like, eating a guy's, like, face and stuff. So The Lighthouse had a lot of similarities to that, but that is something only me and people who are aware of this would know. You know what I mean? But I think that's such a... It's such an easy inspiration to yeah. see that it's, like, I don't know, like, I would assume, I don't know much about, like, the lore behind this. I don't know much yeah. about, like, pirate life. But I would assume that the idea of, like, birds eating away at pirates or eating away at sailors, for example, that's probably got to be a common thread. I yeah, assume, I would right? imagine, yeah. Especially with birds being so prevalent, especially seagulls. And I know the, the idea of people going insane due to isolation is certainly... I, that's that's almost a genre at this oh, point. Yeah. I mean, I was watching Castaway earlier, and Castaway's <laughs> another piece of that. Like, I think that's, it, it's just, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that was, like, inspiration necessarily. It might have been, but, like, I think that's such a broad topic. Oh, no, it, it, yeah. it, it for sure was not an inspiration. Robert Eggers has no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm just saying that it reminded me of that is what I'm saying. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was obviously very, very good. Um but who knows? I mean, I, there could be another movie that takes it out of your uh, your top uh, one this year because Doctor Sleep comes out oh, yeah. in like two or three weeks, I believe. And The Shining is, what, your favorite movie or one of, one of your favorite movies? Yeah. So sh- h- how excited are you for Doctor Sleep and how much do you know about it? So I've I've intentionally not looked into too much. I even someone told me the other day that it's been getting good reviews, and I pretty intentionally didn't look into reviews because I don't want to spoil much for me. Um, I was admittedly a little nervous. Uh, it's a pretty tall tale, tackling a sequel to one of the best movies. I think it's. I, I don't think that's crazy to say that it's one of the best movies ever made for The Shining, but essentially creating a sequel, especially this long after, it is a little bit of a risk. But if anybody's gonna do it well. I trust Mike Flanagan. Mike yeah. Flanagan's made nothing but hits. I'm extremely excited about it. I've seen some shots. Like, I'm I'm going to nerd out for sure over, like, just, like, 
identical shots, for example. Like I saw in the, the trailer, they have that panning shot from the beginning of The Shining. Yeah. There's a shot where uh, where Danny's walking through a hallway and he's got on a coat and he looks exactly like he looks very, yeah. very similar to Jack yeah. when he's walking through the hallways going mad. Like, yeah. I am super excited to catch a lot of those small, small nods to The Shining. And I, I can't wait. People are calling it the best, uh, his the best Stephen King adaptation since Shawshank. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's uh, that's a high tap. Oh, it Chapter Two came out this year too. I yeah. forgot, forgot about that. We've had a lot of Stephen King movies this year. Yeah, I don't think that trend's going away. We've yeah. had a lot in the past but, few years. But like, but in a like, we we've had Pet Cemetery, which was bad, by the way. I did not. Like <laughs> you didn't that like movie. Pet Cemetery? No, I thought the sequel. I thought the remake was pretty bad. Yeah, and then it chapter two. Obviously, he's got like a show out. Like I don't know. It just seems like this year, like in particular, there's been a lot. And yeah, it's not going to slow down anytime soon. Um, I have not read either of the books. Um, although I have owned Doctor Sleep since it came out, I just don't read very often. I own The Shining back there, and I haven't read that. I, you I've haven't been read The Shining because I want to see where where it, it's different, but. I just haven't had a chance to yet. Fun fact, are you aware of the Shining miniseries? I'm not. You're not aware of this? Okay, so I actually had a video about this come out on my channel yesterday, so if you're listening to this, go watch that if you haven't already. But obviously, Stephen King hated The Shining. Yeah. Everybody knows that. So like it and like a few of his other works, he decided to adapt it into a TV miniseries in the 90s. This was in 97. And so it's, it's it's The Shining, but it is obviously not the Kubrick film. Yeah, uh, it's very very strange. Um, there's a part where like a garden hose comes to life and has teeth, oh, that's and weird. there are hedge animals that come to life, and that this was all in the original book. And Stephen King was mad they weren't in the original movie. God. So, God, um, God. as you can, imagine Stanley Kubrick going like, yeah, you see that garden hose over there going to come to life and have teeth like i don't think that that's really going to fit no. what, what he's going for there i i run into so many like it's kind of i i run into so much conflicting feelings about uh how like stephen king hates the shining and it's <laughs> it's sometimes really hard to validate both the shining source material and the shining as a movie but i think they can both exist and both be great in their own rights like I'm a little biased. I love The Shining. I have the key to Room 237 tattooed on my shin, actually. Um, I think... I, I don't know how you could possibly hate that movie. It might not be a true adaptation of the source material, and it might kind of go for a different thing, but Kubrick made it his own, and I think Kubrick pulled off a masterpiece of what he did. Yeah, I mean, it. I mean, this goes with anything. Like, you can't adapt a book word for word and put it on screen and make it good yeah um there's absolutely no way um i guess i i don't know a few movies have tried it in the past there's a really infamous independent version of war of the worlds that ad- essentially adapts it word for word and it's three and a half hours oh, yuck. and it's also terrible <laughs> <laughs> um i haven't seen it but i've seen clips of it um yeah, so I mean, yeah, Stanley Kubrick made it his own. I mean, you can't, you can't do. I I don't know. It's, do a, know. it's a controversial subject, but yeah. Do we know? Does Doctor Sleep follow the Kubrick Shining or the the I, book more? I would. I I don't know which one it fo- the book. Stephen King's book. I like can wholeheartedly probably infer that it has nothing to do with the movie, but in the trailers and in the posters and stuff, we see, like literally, there's a a thing in the poster where it's old Danny on one side and young Danny yeah. from the movie on the other. So I would imagine that they had to take some liberties with this as well. And I mean, Stephen King's old and seasoned now. He, I mean, he understands how it goes. And I mean, I'm sure he's made like a fuck ton of money off the Shining movie, so I guess he can't hate it that much anymore. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Very excited for Dr. Sleep coming out. Um, I noticed you signed into your letterbox over there. What's what do you got going on over there? Uh, I'm gonna see how long it's been since I've been on here, and I might start actually updating stuff. I'm I probably see, I gonna. So you gave Jennifer's body one star. No, this wasn't me actually. Those were like the the. Popular oh, th- th- those are your. Uh, those New are your on letterbox. My. Your friends. I thought you were on your. your no, page. no, no, no. I haven't seen half these movies. <laughs> um, yeah, shit. The last thing I I rated was Don't Think Twice. Great movie, by the way. 
great, great movie. Um, yeah, I'm probably gonna spend the rest of my night after you leave just rating things that I gotta catch up on. <laughs> Very cool. Thanks for that. Yeah, people want to follow you on Letterboxd. How do they find it? It's just Alex Del Pryor. Uh, yeah, you can either look up. I don't know how Letterboxd works for that. My username is just Al Del Pryor. It's the same as my everything, the same yeah. as my Instagram, the same as my Twitter handle, um, or my, just my name, Alex Del Pryor. Either one of those will work. Uh, yeah, you can follow me. I'm going to be catching up for a few days, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. All right, well, we're going to wrap up this podcast and ride off into the sunset. Uh, again, if you guys haven't already, please make sure you subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications, go follow Al on Twitter. He has some prime content coming out on there. Um, yeah, there's not much else to say. Go see the lighthouse. Uh, yeah, this is, that's about it. So this is Buddy and Al signing off, and I will see you again tomorrow with another video. Cool. Thank you so much, buddy.